to today's Excavation Safety Alliance Town Hall. My name is Whitney Price and I'm looking forward to today's discussion on how can we address safety concerns and job delays related to abandoned lines. I'd like to thank our ESA member companies for helping make these town halls possible. It's your support that makes our mission of saving lives through education and collaboration a reality. ESA town halls are an open forum to discuss concerns and present potential solutions to improve damage prevention and excavation safety. This town hall is meant to be a discussion and you're encouraged to ask questions and share solutions. If you have a question, please type it into the chat or click the raise hand icon. Give us a few seconds and we will give you permission to unmute yourself. To unmute, simply click on the microphone icon in the right hand corner of your screen. Please try to keep your comments brief to allow others time to interact. A recording of this town hall will be posted on ESA's YouTube channel. At the conclusion of the town hall, each of our panelists will highlight a moving forward step to ensure we stay focused on practical and impactful solutions. We will conclude today at 1130 AM Central. I'm pleased to have such a great panel with a wealth of knowledge and expertise. So to get us started, I'd like our moderator and panel members to give a little background on themselves. Sandy, I'll turn it over to you now. Great, thank you so much, Whitney. And thank you everybody for attending our sessions today. Um, my name is Sandy Holmes and I'm with Arizona 811, as Whitney mentioned. Um, I just entered my 42nd year with Arizona 811 and um, I've been the executive director here for the past 26 of those years. So today I'm looking forward to uh, moderating this great panel and telling you how we in Arizona um, work to help excavators identify when uncovered, unmarked lines are active or abandoned. Um, but first, let's, you know, we're going to have the rest of our panel members introduce themselves as well. So let's start with Chris. Thanks, Sandy, and hello, everyone. Thanks for allowing me to be a part of this. My name is Chris Stovall. I'm president and CEO of Texas 811, also co founder and CEO of a company called Lionscape that you'll hear a little bit about later on in this. I'm a 20 year 811 industry vet, uh, but I've been involved in safety. Uh, in some way, shape, or form since I was a teenager. So glad to be here. And how about Kurt? Uh, Kurt Young's president of Young's Excavating. Uh, I also sit on the Indiana 811 board of directors uh, and uh, uh, NUCA primary on the CGA. Uh, 45 years in the business, 35 as an owner. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty well uh, aware of what abandoned lines mean to us. And Al. I'm Al Field. I uh, am a retiree from the Arizona Public Service Power Company here, where I spent 33 years there. Uh, worked with ADOT, the Department of Transportation, here for 10 years. Worked on the hot light rail as it was implemented in, in Phoenix area. And the SkyTrain at the, uh, at the uh, Sky Harbor Airport. Uh, I, I hate to tell how many years I've been involved, but it's over 40. So uh, uh, we have my uh, our own company, Alfield and Associates, and we serve the civil engineering community by utility coordination and locating and mapping uh, underground utilities. And actually, I've known um, Al for all these years that I've been involved. He was actually on our um, executive committee when I first started at Arizona Blue Stake back then, Arizona 811 now. So um, so thank you, um, panel. Um, so to set the stage for today's discussion, we should talk about what an abandoned line is, right? So um, for the purpose of today, we're going to talk um, abandoned lines are um, lines that are no longer in service and they are physically disconnected from the live portion of the facility that still carries um, services. So since they're physically disconnected, they're generally not able to be specifically located and marked by the underground utility companies who are going out to mark the lines that they currently own. So um, they exist underground somewhere, um, but we don't always know where until they're uncovered many times. So, um, so you know, that's how we're going to um, discuss them today. So some states like Arizona have required abandoned lines to be identified on installation records, but many other states have not had um, that requirement in place. So, um, you know, so they're they're an issue in the field when contractors or anybody who's excavating are working around them. So why does this matter? Um, and how can that existence of abandoned lines impact construction process? So if we consider an ideal scenario when an excavator requests marks and they 
um, are, are waiting for those marks to come out and 100 percent of the underground facility operators who are affected by their location come out and um, locate their the existing mar um, facilities that are underground or by telling the excavator they don't have anything in the area where the digging is going to happen um, the excavator can start their work right so ideally they're going to start their work and everything's going to go great but sometimes they uncover something that's not marked and you know do they automatically think oops these marks must be wrong so we, we should contact the utilities and have them come back out and answer you know and, and identify them or do they think these must be abandoned let's just tear them out and move on obviously that you know the the former the, um, we want them to question it we want them to ask questions we you know we want them to um, take precautions but um, you know we're always concerned about somebody making that assumption that it's not live or that it is abandoned and and having something disastrous happen so um so you know what what should they do what responsibilities does an excavator have what responsibilities do the facility owners or prior facility owners for those abandoned lines have and so that's where we're going to start our discussion today so um kurt let's start with you um, as a contractor how does the discovery of unmarked lines impact you and what what do your crews do in the scenario I described? Uh, well, it, it typically leads to a lot of downtime and a lot of extra phone calls. Uh, you know, if uh, we discover during the pothole process before the actual excavation starts, uh, we can add some, uh, you know, make some phone calls and predetermine before we start digging uh, whether it's live or dead. Uh, it's the ones that. Uh, we come across uh, that didn't happen during the potholing that uh, suddenly nobody knew anything about and uh, then the crew comes to a halt and the, the meter starts running and it leads to you know a lot of expense uh, so those are the ones that uh, we really like to uh, try to determine and, and you know a lot of times if the utility gives us a warning bark uh, that there may be something uh, abandoned in the area that can be sufficient but uh, too often it doesn't happen uh, what really helps is if uh during the locate process if they put the the size and type of whatever facility they're locating uh so then we can kind of determine as we follow if we got the right uh, facility or not or if there's something abandoned in the area how often does that happen? How often are they marking the t size and type of facility that is um, uh, has been marked? In Indiana here, it's mandatory for the gas facilities uh, to put size and type of material. Uh, but all the other facilities do not. Some voluntarily do it, uh, which definitely helps, uh, but it doesn't happen that often. Mm -hmm. And how do you know who to call then? Uh, well, that leads to problems. You know, typically we have to go back through the 811 system to try to get a response. Uh, but through uh, networking and, and everything and, and just history with the facility owners, uh, we usually have a list of phone numbers that uh, we go to that we can get a response. Um, Al or, or Chris, do you have any other thoughts about that? about um you know what contract what you've known contractors to have to do well my my uh, solution for that is <clears throat> pardon me that uh, the ASCE or uh, American Society of Civil Engineers has a process called SUE SUE subsurface utility engineering that uh, requires the civil engineer designing the project to do all of the pro all of the uh, locating and marking uh, of utilities during design. Uh, that avoids all the equipment shutdown and delays that the contractor has if he encounters something that he uh, didn't anticipate. Now, there are all kinds of methods. Uh, there are probably at least 10 or 12 different ways to mark utilities and abandoned lines are the uh, harbinger, if you will, of, uh, of problems. And so, uh, the latest technology for locating things that you don't want to find during construction is uh, ground penetrating radar, which uh, will locate anything from a big rock underground to uh, 
uh, an abandoned facility. Most uh, utilities, uh, whenever they abandon something, they disconnect it from uh, the uh, uh, source line. And so it's very difficult, if not impossible, to locate it using uh, electronic means. And so uh, GPR uh, locates everything that's underground, typically. And if there's a question about it during the design process, if it's uh, going, going to possibly interfere with the uh, contractor's uh, uh, excavation, uh, uh, there's always the potholing or test holing uh, process that will identify whatever was found underground. Chris, do you have anything, Chris, do you have anything to add? Yeah, just listening to Kurt and, and Al talk here, um, I mentioned that prior to my 20 year stint in the 811 industry, I've, I have been involved with uh, safety in some capacity. And uh, before 811, I worked uh, for the FAA and in the air traffic control system, there's an idea that we are, you know, first and foremost, keeping planes from touching, right? Like you don't want that to happen, but then it's safe and expeditious flow of air traffic. And I think about this in the same way, like when I hear uh, Kurt talk about how this 811 system is working now, um, I, I feel like we're safe um, and we've done a, a pretty good job at, at that. The expeditious side could use some work. I mean, if we're making an 811 connection and then having to make two or three or four additional connections after 811, that doesn't seem very expeditious to me. And I think there's a, a lot of opportunity for us to focus on on that piece of the puzzle while not compromising safety. So do you want to tell us about the proactive process you have in place in Texas? Uh, sure. Yeah, thanks. Uh, good segue, I guess. So um, a few years ago, uh, Texas 811, we started working on some technology. Uh, and, and really, the idea was we wanted to be able to visualize uh, the underground on a smart device. And it was more of an idea, uh, not necessarily with a use case at the time. Um, it was, uh, you know, late 2016, 2017, I think, when Pokemon Go was the big hit and people started visualizing uh, augmented reality world on their phones. And we started thinking about what that could do for our industry if people could actually visualize underground lines on their phones. And so we developed the technology without much of a use case. And um, as we were in the process of spinning it off into a separate entity, because it was really outside of 811's core, um, and we have some restrictions in Texas that uh, don't allow the 811 system to distribute those maps. So as we were in this process of spinning this out to a separate entity, which today is called Landscape, I was approached by Kinder Morgan, who had heard about this effort that we have, and they said, could you use this for uh, abandoned facilities? And I was like, man, that's a, a terrific idea. So they were really the pioneer of thinking about how to take this technology that we had worked on and actually bringing it to practical use in the industry. So um, long story short, uh, about a year and a half, two years ago, we started that project with Kinder Morgan. We uh, took their abandoned facilities, registered them with the 811 system, and now anytime someone is digging near those abandoned facilities, we deliver what we call a digital locate to the excavator. The excavator gets it instantly, and they can see that facility mapped out on uh, a satellite view of the area that they're located in. It's delivered to their device in the field. Um, it's interactive with GPS coordinates uh, and measuring tools and, and everything you need uh, to know that there's an additional facility out there. And for us in Texas, that was huge because prior to that, there was nothing. So we went from zero to uh, pretty good information that there's abandoned facilities in the area. To date, we've sent out probably 40,000 or so digital locates, uh, zero safety incidents, lots of positive feedback from the field, and expanded beyond uh, just Kinder Morgan using this to other uh, pipeline owners as well. But you're primarily focused on pipeline owners at this point. That is uh, primarily where we're focused. Um, I would say probably the number one or number two piece of feedback I get from the field is when are we going to have other 
uh, abandoned facilities participating in this. And um, if somebody uncovers something in the field um, and contacts the, the Texas 811 Center, um, are there any other um, assistance items that you're providing them to help them identify what those are? Yes, we could definitely uh, benefit from some streamlining of this process, but our railroad commission in Texas uh, has a data set of abandoned facilities with last known owners um, and that sort of thing. So we can track back uh, and provide additional information. But to Kurt's point uh, earlier, as a part of this digital locate, we provide all of the last known attributes. So size, material, type, coding, all of that stuff to try to give as much information uh, to the field person as we can. Okay. So, um, you know, building off of what um, Chris just talked about, what they're doing in Texas, which is a really good proactive way of handling um, abandoned lines, especially for pipelines at this point. Um, Arizona has had one in place for many years. So for the past 36 years, our law has required the utilities to keep abandoned lines on their installation records. And, you know, in Arizona, from then until now, 36 years ago until now, our state has grown, you know, by more than 125% in population. In fact, we went from the 25th most populated state to the 14th. So, you know, we've actually probably installed um, and buried and abandoned and reburied more facilities um, since then than we had in place at the time that that requirement was put into place. So, you know, they had to start somewhere and they started then. Um, our law also requires that the utility notify an excavator when they have abandoned lines in the area. And generally, many of them now are using the, a symbol that is an A with a circle around it in their color of the specified type of facility that they own. And it doesn't tell them because we, as we have already mentioned, it, they cannot be located and marked specifically because, um, you know, they're they're disconnected. Um, but they at least the excavator has some awareness that there's those abandoned facilities in the area. So that our, our law then also requires that the excavator not treat anything that's apparently abandoned as abandoned unless it's been verified to, um, to be that. Um, and then that same law requires the 811 center to have a method in place of sending qualified personnel from the facility owners to the field to visually inspect those facilities that are uncovered to determine if they're their own, if they own them, and if so, if they're active or abandoned. Um, so we refer to that process as the unknown line process. Um, we're held accountable for it. So we make sure that you know it's in place where we do a lot of them in the state. Um, there's three steps to it. And when I say a lot of them, I mean, in, throughout 2023, we did um, over 3,200 uh, um, unknown line processes. That's about 13 every day that we handle. So they're escalated. They're, you know, a lot of questions go out. We're, we're communicating with those facility owners throughout the entire day, getting them out there. They have a two hour response time to identify, to visually inspect those facilities and tell us um, and the excavator what the status is of their identification. 86% um, of those um, 3,200 are were identified within the first step. So usually in those two hour processes, usually within just a couple of hours, the excavator knows what it is, if it's active or abandoned, and they can you know, move on with their work. 9% um, of those or so um, escalate to step two and we have to you know, do a little bit more checking and figuring out who's, who's they might be or what they might be. Um, and then there are about 4% of them or about one every other day that go to a step three process, which is much more um, intense. We have to, you know, we're looking at old records. We're talking to people who might know the history of the area, whether it's an ag area or, or we're even looking at tickets that were created recently to install new facilities that might not have been marked. And, you know, this project that's crossing one that just recently occurred, you know, might have uncovered something they just installed. Um, so we're, we're, trying to do as much as we can but many of those step three ones actually go unclaimed and we have to tell the excavator that it's active and they need to figure out how to work around it luckily there's not many of those that that happen so um you know it's it's about we have about three people who do about 70 percent of their day is handling unknown lines because there's 
um, probably 90 communication points that happen throughout the day on those 13 unknown lines that are that um, you know we're averaging. So, um, Kurt, what safety protocols do you think could be improved to minimize the risks related to abandoned lines during your projects? Well, uh, that's a hu huge problem because you know a cable looks like a cable. Uh, you know, uh, trying to identify between the communications cable and power because uh, electric and gas are the two things that'll kill you instantly. Uh, so uh, that's the biggest thing uh, that we run across that is a big concern. You know, uh, in our area, most of the new gas is plastic, and so we run across the steel or definitely cast iron. Is, we know that one's a, abandoned, but uh, there are some steel lines that's, that's still active and on the distribution side also. Uh, Transmission will be all steel, and we know uh, where those are. They do a really good job on transmission lines of uh, keeping us in the loop, whether they're alive or abandoned. Uh, distribution is a whole different story, and uh, that that can go for uh, just about everybody, from gas to telecom to everything. Uh, on the distribution side, it, it's a mess. Uh, they didn't keep any records uh, when they abandoned things. Uh, Sometimes it'll bleed over and they locate uh, the abandons, sometimes not. Uh, it, if you can pick it up during the pothole process, you know, you can get the the questions started. Uh, but if it's outside the, the pothole area, your, your, your tolerance zone, and then uh, you run across it during excavation, uh, like I said, I always joke that the 811 is not the one call system, it's the first call. And uh, you kind of move on from there, but uh, yeah, it, it's it's a huge safety issue that uh, you know. I always said you know in our industry, kind of around here, uh, the locator gets the most blame, and he's the lowest paid guy on the job sometimes, and that's that's totally unfair. Uh, but uh, we depend on them a lot, so. So from a safety protocol standpoint, your your protocol is don't assume it's abandoned because it's very dangerous, right? So we kind of uh, talked about that earlier. If we uncover it, we assume everything's live. Uh, we never make an assumption that anything's abandoned. Uh, we play it as it's live. Uh, even if we're 90% sure it's abandoned, it doesn't matter. That other 10% doesn't matter. Uh, mm -hmm. And we'll just work around it and move on uh, unless there's a conflict with what we're installing and then uh, the phone call process starts again. And obviously, you know, we want some input from the audience on some of these topics as well. If anybody has any um, specifics they want to bring up, you know, please flag that in the in the chat as well. Al, um, yeah. what are your thoughts about strategies that could be implemented for the long term maintenance, monitoring or even removal of abandoned mines? Any thoughts about that? You bet. Uh, there's uh, quite a few options. Uh, number one, uh, reuse. And that's that's where you run into a little bit of trouble. Like Kurt was saying, you know, you un uncover an old uh, uh, pipeline, you assume it's uh, abandoned and cut it out or whatever. Uh, well, out here we have quite a few uh, old uh, uh, petroleum lines that have been abandoned. And back whenever the uh, cable companies were looking for a way to save money, they found out that some of these pipelines were available for reuse and so they uh, made arrangements with the petroleum companies to take over that uh, the ownership of that like a 16 inch gas line and they put cable in it so uh, uh, a lot of times you don't know what's in the cable or apartment in the conduit uh, there might not, it might be identified as an abandoned gas line and here you got a bunch of cable in it uh, one of the cities out here, the city of Mesa, has a, a, a program of, of a, taking their abandoned water lines and uh, using them for other purposes, for instance, cable or other, uh, to avoid excavating. Uh, and so it's uh, very, very uh, important that you do uh, not assume it's an abandoned line, uh, that there might be something else in it, and uh, that the uh, owner the new owner identify it as a 16 inch conduit for your 1200 pair cable or whatever things of that nature so uh the other thing is uh 
uh, one of the things that I, uh, I think that should uh, be mandatory is that uh, during a governmental project, improving a street or whatever, whenever they're taking the pavement up and going to replace it, there should be some process to uh, co connect with all the utilities that have abandoned lines and make sure that they get removed during that construction process. Uh, they, they're, uh, it's a whole lot easier than telling them whenever they issue a permit that you have to take out the old one, which might disrupt the uh, uh, traffic, it might uh, remove uh, good pavement and have to make it replaced. But for instance, in Arizona, in Phoenix here, there's a certain area of town where there's no more right away. Uh, there's, uh, you know, the right away is full of uh, active and abandoned utilities and the city is asking or uh, requiring that if you are putting something new in that area, you have to remove something that uh, uh, is active. Maybe if you're, you know, consolidate your uh, utilities. And so that's another um, strategy you might improve uh, on. Uh, and again, it's expensive, but the different uh, agencies that control the right of way have the opportunity whenever they issue a permit to require removal of uh, uh, and, and the, whatever they're improving, uh, you know, trench alongside whatever you've got there. If you're going to improve it uh, and uh, uh, take out the old stuff whenever you whenever you uh, uh, install the new stuff, the uh, the thing that uh, is is very very uh, confusing for contractors. You get out there and there's two cables there. One of them is alive and the other one's dead. Uh, we had to redesign a bridge here in the Phoenix area, Northwest Phoenix, because uh, the utility identified and marked the abandoned line as the good line, and the uh, existing new line was identified as dead and so the contractor gets out there and he uh, drills down and finds the uh, uh, abandoned one and he drills right through it well guess what that was uh, a marked abandoned but it was really the live line so each utility uh, may or may not know what they have existing in the field i do see a lot of comments in the chat about record keeping and you know keeping track of what's out there um, and even potentially the use of um, coordinates, uh, XYZ coordinates. Are there, is there any place across the country that we can identify as somebody, as a place that is actually doing that regularly um, or has been doing it for a while? I mean, we have to start somewhere. We can't necessarily go back and do what's already in the ground um, unless we're uncovering it or, or um, utilizing it. Um, is, is there somebody, and maybe can, somebody can provide that information in the chat a city or a, a geographic area that's that's requiring XYZ on um, records? Uh, yeah, here in Indiana, uh, we have several communities, Mishawaka, uh, Carmel, uh, the Hamilton County, uh, all their facilities require every, anything new going in there to be XYZ. So if you're a contractor installing something there, uh, you're going to give them GIS and GPS <clears throat> ordinates on everything that you put in the ground, uh, which is a, absolutely a fantastic way to go. And uh, in a long term, over the course of 50 years, uh, if if everything was uh, X, Y, Z as it went in the ground and the technology is there, even if you're drilling, uh, to X, Y, Z it as it goes in the ground, uh, we might be able to root this problem out uh, 40, 50 years from now. Just to tag on to that, uh, Sandy, the uh... ASCE has another standard out, a brand new one called 75, standard 75-22, which uh, gives the installer uh, exact way to identify where the uh, new facilities are placed. Again, you know, standard 38-22, which, which uh, talks about Sioux and utility mm -hmm. uh, uh, coordination during the uh, excavator design process. Uh, if you refer to those two, uh, standard 38 and 75, uh, ASC also has a manual out that's called Sue for Municipalities. It's actually Sue, actually should be Sue for everybody, but uh, 
it tells and gives you some standard specifications that you can include in your project specifications. It requires the uh, consulting engineer that designs the project, whoever designs the project, to go through a certain process to uh, eliminate the need for all of these problems that we're just talking about. Uh, one other thing to add to that is uh, it sounds like there's certain states that are already putting in these uh, policies or laws with an eye to the future. Uh, I'm aware of a handful of equipment manufacturers and uh, utility and pipeline owners and even uh, locators who are deploying technology today where they're able to capture this information while they're already out in the field. And I think that's another great step forward for our industry. Yeah, I, re I recommend that we uh, find a way to use uh, drones and LIDAR to do that while the trench is open. You can get 3D uh, XYZ uh, instantaneously, instantaneously while that drone is flying with the LIDAR. Very interesting. So how, how do you think, Chris, the, the process of sharing data about abandoned lines between utilities and excavators can improve, um, to be improved, be improved to create a more seamless process? So uh, a couple of things come to mind um, on how the process could be improved, and I also have some thoughts on how the technology could be improved. And this is uh, almost maybe 1% my idea, 99% what I hear from others when uh, we actually have deployed this. Um, number one thing, as I mentioned earlier, the process would be improved with more participants. If more people were providing this known data uh, to be delivered, that would improve the, the sharing of information. Um, and I want to address kind of one of the number one questions I get about that. Uh, for some who are on the call and, and maybe are thinking about all the challenges with that. Number one question is, is the data still valuable if it's not precise? Um, and I think Kurt answered that question for us um, early on, is if, if you're getting zero data today, then some data, even if it's not precise, is better. That moves us forward. If you know something's out there that you're, that you're needing to be aware of, um, it's absolutely better than nothing. So we don't have to let perfect be the enemy of good on this data sharing. Um, and the second thing I think that would improve the process is education. Um, how do we use the data once we get it and making that clear um, with this uh, program that we've launched uh, in Texas where we're sharing abandoned land data. Uh, we, we started it with almost zero education. Um, and now we're kind of go, you know, doing this education as we go. The, the information is pretty intuitive, and I think the professional excavators know how to use what's being delivered to them. But I think some uh, standards around how that data is used in different circumstances would definitely help this process. Technology. So for, oh, yeah, I'm go ahead. ahead. I would say just for clarification purposes. So the, the excavator gets this map. They identify there's an abandoned line. Is that the end all? Do then they just assume that that something they uncover is abandoned, or they is there a verification process in place as well? So, from my understanding, this is feedback uh, from the field. And Kurt, if if you guys do something different, uh, I'd love to hear it. But uh, it is if it is in direct conflict, then there is a verification process that happens. Um, if it's not in direct conflict, then it's more of a additional piece of information that's it's good to know if we if we come across it or encounter it, um, then we're aware and ready for that. Okay. So um, they just assume it's abandoned. Is there any process that involved with with the pipeline companies you're working for or working with to um, remove it if it's if it's exposed, or is that not part of the discussion? In Texas, I have not uh, heard of any efforts to remove uh, once it's exposed. And um, the way that the uh, situation works in Texas is it, it's a little bit the way that I understand it is once it's abandoned, it belongs to the landowner. Um, so at that point, there's not an obligation for the previous owner to go in and uh, remove it or do anything with it. One of the things that I was going to add and how I think the process could be improved and it's it's a it's it's a process, but it's also 
technology, and that is a 360 degree feedback loop. So right now, um, if we deliver this abandoned information out to the excavator and they encounter that abandoned facility on site, uh, what we don't have is a feedback loop back to the 811 system, back to the GIS database, back to the Linescape application that either confirms that it's still there or uh, says we don't find it in this area. Um, my understanding is sometimes uh, when abandoned facilities are encountered, they are removed. And so if we're still showing them mapped in the 811 system, then we could be sending out information showing something's there that's long gone by now. So I think some process for updating that database as we go will be helpful. Anybody else have any comments about that? So uh, yeah, we, yeah, we, okay. we, we have a lot of information as contractors and, and sometimes we don't know where to send it. Uh, so that would be a, a perfect scenario right there because you know we're already active uh, X, Y, and Z and everything that we have, but uh, we would go to the trouble and the expense to do it if we know somebody would accept it and use it. You're muted, Al. Yeah, thank you. Let me also say that uh, utility companies don't many times uh, understand the, the value of getting their maps updated instantaneously, if you will. Uh, we found a change to a design where a uh, utility owner uh, 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 excavator changed, actually changed the side of the road where the utility was installed and didn't update their maps for three years. And we were out there locating, trying to find this uh, existing gas line, it was, and certainly uh, I couldn't find it. We uh, investigated, they investigated and found that their mapping department had it and had had it for three years before, and they hadn't updated their mapping yet. So uh, especially when a freeway or a highway gets improved, uh, things change rapidly for the utilities that have been making adjustments for that uh, project. And uh, the maps that the locator uses need to be updated uh, almost instantaneously for that for that uh, utility. Mm -hmm. Mike, do we have any questions from the from our audience? Yeah, one question is um, Chris was referring to the abandoned line going back to the landowner. So are those that are identified then assigned a responsible party going forward? And then kind of building on that, uh, we have a question here from Willard, does in quotes legal agree agree with the interpretation of once abandoned then revert it back to landowner so the so question, yeah i'm sorry i was going to just tap in there as i'm sorry uh that if um, if that's the case is the landowner responsible for for locating that abandoned line then i uh never completed my my law degree so I definitely don't want to I don't want to tread into the area of what does legal mean and what does it not mean and, and that sort of thing I think I could get myself into trouble trying to answer that question directly what I can say practically is what happens right now in Texas is a facility is abandoned and the responsibility uh, of that or the ownership of that is turned over to the landowner uh, landowner in, in some cases could be a sophisticated landowner, in other cases could not be. Um, and I don't see practically uh, the landowners then registering that abandoned facility data with 811 system or taking any proactive measures to notify excavators in any way that it's there. Um, I, I don't see any documentation happening. Um, it is reported to the Railroad Commission in Texas when it's abandoned, and that's kind of the, the last uh, that it's addressed. One of the reasons why we adopted this proactive approach is we can, as the 811 system through the Lionscape application, we can be proactive in an area where uh, there's a big gap right now because it's not addressed um, from a legal standpoint. Just to, uh, to tag onto that, if the abandoned line is in the city right away, does the city 
become the owner of that abandoned line then? You know, just a rhetorical question. That's a yes. Is that a yes, Chris? <laughs> Well, I was well, agreeing with the, the philosophical uh, point of, of the question. <laughs> can, can a land, I may see a question in the chat. Can a land owner refuse to take possession of it? Or is it just an inherent um, assumption that they're taking possession? Well, they'll typically uh, refuse any responsibility for it. Uh, it uh, if it's a municipality, it, it's in there right away. Uh, some projects. Uh, they'll pay us to remove things. Uh, most of the time, uh, it's at our discretion. If we know it's abandoned, to cut it out of the way, uh, to ease our installation. But uh, yeah, for for the most part, nobody claims any responsibility for it. I know you know the um, the many unknown line processes we we um, take care of here. Um, the ones that get identified in the first step. There's a, a good sized number of them that are actually active. So having that approach does help to um, pre pre um, prevent damage to things that are active and can be you know, either volatile or expensive if they are damaged accidentally. You know, and who's liable is probably not, who is liable for it, it's probably not the issue when it comes to an injury or, or worse. So, um, you know, we, I think you know, having something in place is always better than having nothing in place. Um, Mike, do we have any other any more questions? Yeah, we have a few more. This one was Good. much earlier from Doug Beck. Um, how about requiring the use of rod radar buckets while digging? The use I didn't hear the the use of rod radar. R O D R A D A R. Doug, maybe you can expand upon I'm that. I'm saying maybe yeah, maybe he could expand. Another one. Um, any idea of how many states require mapping of abandoned facilities by statute? Al, is that something you discovered in your um, in your um, all the documentation that you have? Do you, are there a number of them? Uh, there are quite a few, but not enough. Let's put it that way. Uh, most well, even in Arizona. Uh, some utilities are not even aware that they're required to keep that abandoned line uh, on their maps. So it's uh, it's difficult to enforce, let's put it that way. And, and that and that it is definitely true. It's something Another, we talk about at membership, but um, you know, not always um, doesn't always follow the path of uh, turnover. So. Mike, any Another more? question that's been fairly active in the chat is about having a central database that can be accessed by all state one call members. That's by Adam and other people have kind of chimed in and saying there might be a competitive advantage issue with the fiber companies. And also when it comes to gas pipelines, there could be a homeland security risk. Any mm -hmm. thoughts? I understand that uh, Colorado may have a central uh, mapping where you can call it uh, whether it's 811 or whatever it is uh, in Colorado and uh, all the maps that you need are available there. I'm not I haven't exercised that because we're in Arizona, but I, I've heard that that's true. I personally am a huge proponent of that idea. I understand uh, all the objections and you know I can even agree with some of them, but I think one of the things that will propel our industry forward, improve safety, improve the timeliness of how we get the job done will be better data and then sharing that data. I mean, I just I just fully believe that that's the future of our industry. And potentially and reducing the unnecessary damage. damages as well, right? Absolutely. So, but because the confusion causes yeah. damages. Um, so in, in Texas, Chris, the the database that the Railroad Commission holds, it's only pipelines or is it anybody who had something? Yeah, that's correct. It's only pipelines. And, um, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a, a, a great idea. Um, again, it's about that access and the, the correlation to the dig site. And that's one of the reasons that we developed the application we did is it directly connects to the 811 ticket. Um, you know, generally speaking, if it's being done right, 
most of the work goes through the 811 system before it happens. And so it's a seamless and simple way for the excavator to get that additional piece of data directly related to the area that they're working in instead of having to go and kind of search through a, an online database. Um, I think we need that database, but then we need the mechanism for delivering that information uh, in a relevant way and in a timely way to the end user. And regarding the question about the uh, Homeland Security issues, most utilities uh, require a background check of whoever's requesting mapping and whatever. So uh, uh, that may be uh, something that on the, the utilities that, that don't use that process, uh, make sure that they ensure that whoever uh, receives their their maps is uh, qualified through a, some kind of a background check. I, I've always uh, laughed at that Homeland Security argument because as soon as you call for a locate and they put paint on the ground, it's public knowledge. No, knowing the location is public knowledge at that point, but ne not necessarily what exactly it is that's under there, right? Or what it's feeding. So, um, but once it's abandoned, does that competitive advantage or or Homeland Security issue even, you know, come into play? I see we do have somebody's hand up. All right, Stephanie, I have uh, allowed you to unmute if you'd like. Stephanie, did, did you know you raised your hand? Possibly that was an error. Oh, the unmute issue does happen once in a long while. I'm going to try to disable and re-enable your mic here. Sometimes we've found you have to leave and come back in, unfortunately. Uh, but we'll try this. It does look you'll probably have to leave the meeting and come right back in and then we'll I'll unmute you again. Just raise your hand one more time. Thank you. And I see the comment that terrorists can call and locate tickets. They certainly can. <laughs> we don't have a security or a background check for for requesting locates, right? Any other Any questions? Other questions for for you know, Sandy, we probably addressed this uh, thoroughly earlier, but um, Tracy Bryan had kind of a two parter. So, if an excavator confirms an abandoned line, is it usually removed from the site or torn out as part of the work? And then later, it was is the utility notified when there are no abandoned utilities ripped out of the ground as part of an excavator? Job is that something that that uh, Centerpoint is doing, Tracy? Are you removing abandoned lines when you're aware? Is that what you're saying? I know in in Arizona, and Al mentioned this a little bit a while ago um, in in this discussion. Um, we had a right of way owner who was had originally been requesting all abandoned facilities to be removed. Period. Now, obviously, that becomes a very expensive um, concern for the facility owners who have, you know, many years of abandoned facilities in that right of way. So it, it became a huge issue for a while, and ultimately, they they rested on, you know, if we have a very large road project or re, a reconstruction project, that those facilities would be removed at that time. Um, I'm trying to catch up with uh, Tracy here. Oh, so you're asking the question, does are there any um, projects that are requiring uh, from a construction practice to remove abandoned facilities when they're exposed? So maybe Kurt, you could touch on that. Uh, yeah, uh, th there are some municipal uh, projects that they've, uh, I don't want to say they took Sue to the A level, but it, a strong B. And so there was known uh, abandoned facilities in there and uh, there was a pay item to remove them. Uh, now, a lot of times, if you're in what I call the land of sand, uh, you can remove abandoned facilities pretty cheaply and, and get them out of the way. But uh, if you're having to, to chase them down and, and 
export the the excavated soils and import backfill it can get really pricey and uh, so a lot of times they'll just say leave them be uh, so it, it becomes a, an economic issue for the owner of the project uh, as much as it is for the contractor so it could depend on the size of the facility being that's abandoned if it's mm -hmm. a large diameter it might cost more to remove it than leave it in place or um, it, it comes down to the size of your bucket <laughs> oh there you go yeah uh, <laughs> I, I think that you might consider if if you're considering that type of uh, uh, an alternative is to require the utility owner to remove their abandoned facilities during the project so well from a contractor standpoint then they need to be way out ahead of us uh, because typically if they're, if they're trying to get in there at the same time we are, that uh, uh, there's a military term for it, and I won't say that now. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if, it, if it's a part of the contract that you know that they're going to be out there during your project, then you can uh, use that during, you know, you can uh, use that to uh, uh, in include in your cost basis. Sandy, I know uh, you're the, you're our moderator, um, but I have a question for you because I, I think uh, Arizona has really, you guys have been doing this for a long time. We have a, a lot that we could learn from you and what you guys have accomplished there. Mm -hmm. And so some of the questions that you're seeing come through around uh, ownership and responsibility and liability, like how do you, how would you recommend uh, states that haven't, have not adopted some of that stuff yet think about the best way to handle like once it's abandoned who's responsible and uh in scenarios where you may have companies that go out of business or uh right away landowners and that sort of thing right um well obviously you know we already talked about the requirement to have the abandoned facilities remain on installation records um there is some confusion in some cases um, but we are identifying a very high percentage of those abandoned lines that are uncovered um it's it's a matter of doing something. So even if even if a state or um, an area started small with one contractor to kind of test plan it, you know, they uncover something and they and we were, were work, you're working with specific facility owners to help identify it. There's, the visual inspection piece of it for us, I think, is um, the most relative and the most impactful. They go out, they visually inspect it. They can tell if it's an, uh, you know, an electric line. They can see where it's heading. They might have some other visual clues out there to help them identify what it is. Um, and and when it when it's active, you know, they can take care of it right away and and get it marked because it was supposed to be marked to begin with. Um, and, you know, we have a lot more taking responsibilities. When it gets to step two and we're having a difficult time identifying an owner and step three, that when when we really have not identified an owner, now we're just trying to figure out what it might be and, and if it's you know old irrigation from an ag area, an agricultural area or something like that, that we you know we're we're running into some difficulties. Um, you know, the facility owners have have done a great job though of taking responsibility for for putting this plan into place and and um, and making sure that they are responding to us. Um, but we, like I said, you know, we spend a lot of time every day doing it. But I think it's it's good for the excavator. They have a place they can go to ask questions. There's again back to that one call to to um, back to us to ha have us help them get those questions answered and find the most qualified people. We do have them if they tell us they think it's telephone or they think it's gas. We do focus on those facility owners on that particular ticket first so that we're not impacting all of the others um, and less necessary. So, um, you know, and and contractors are smart. They know, many times they know what it is. So that, that's why we're able to identify a lot of them right away. So, you know, that it's very helpful and it's a very good interactive process. And it's part of our educational program. So whenever we're out giving presentations or seminars or on our um, online education, we're talking about that abandoned line process or the unknown line process and what steps they need to do in order to um, to you know maintain their safety and the safety of their crews. Does that answer the question? Um, is, is did Stephanie join us again? Is that whose hand is up? There we go. Oh, no. I don't know how to get my wife on there. But... 
anyway, <laughs> what I wanted to say was um, mapping is critical and what this comes down to. And I think going forward, if we could be better at mapping everything, um, it would really help. So we have a couple different sides of the house where a utility contract or directional boring were um we're uh, heavy civil we're heavy commercial contractors where we're using you know all gps model um installations and so i've been saying for a long time where do those when we have our gps models because we can go back in dig right over the top of a sewer line with machine controls and put two inches between us and the sewer line and without even being in the ditch but where does that information go on my utility side, there's times that we're crossing 50, 50 utilities a day. And where does that information go? I would love to find a way for us to put in, hey, here's here's my pictures of my hydrovac. He's got a depth on here. He found it here. He didn't find it there. It was mislocated, located correctly. I would love to have a net, uh, some type of a database. And I think if somebody decided, I took it to Google Earth years ago and they said, you do it. So <laughs> I never went anywhere. But if we could do that, think about that vision. Because in the future, we have both crowdsourced um, locations. Like we use our phones for, we have a timestamp that's pretty accurate on the GPS. It tells you everything on there. Um, and that's how we record everything. But where does it go? When our bore machines are running, everything's GPS. We deliver those to the uh, fiber optic company that we're working for or whoever it is you know it could be gas or whatever where does it go because they all have legacy systems and we're trying to work with people right now um because the gis stuff is not accurate whatsoever because of the way it goes in i mean i've seen it where somebody puts in 700 feet uh pipe and they put it on a xy coordinate map and all of a sudden it's running through the house because we're in xyz and we're in the mountains so having that gps data in a place where everybody can access it would be critical in the future because then abandoned lines are very easy to deal with and if we find an abandoned line it can be added and so we can work through that process but i think we have to work going forward um i did put in there earlier we had an abandoned line we we found it with the hydrovac and weren't looking for it we're looking for a phone line and we found it and we're like an unlocated gas line what was abandoned However, there was a two inch uh, transition fitting coming off the main that was you know, still live for six feet. They never marked that. Had we moved over four feet where we had thought we had an open area to go, we'd have hit it and tore it right off the steel main. So it's important, the mapping is critical. And I don't understand why the mapping sometimes is just left out. I don't, I don't understand that. So that's kind of, I, I and, think it's critical. Thank you, Scott. And and Mike, I think that might be a you know a good topic for a another session to move this discussion forward. Like what can we do from a technology standpoint and a sharing standpoint to improve this whole process on a national basis? Well, Would yeah, that... from a con from a contractor's point of view, I, I've always said uh if a facility uh was spending the money to put it in the ground, wouldn't you want to XYZ it to know where it's at? You know, uh, too often it goes in the ground in a shotgun method and uh, until somebody calls for a locate, nobody really knows where it's at. And that's a shame. And so this is the time of our uh, discussion that we should be asking our panel members to give a key takeaway about abandoned lines. And I'll start with a real quick one. And I mentioned this already. I think there's really no one silver bullet solution for this problem. But it's important to start somewhere, you know, do, with, and do something, right? Even like I mentioned, you know, starting a small test area with the with the proof of concept with the contractor who's identifying or or encountering um, un, unmarked, uncovered lines, and then you know, getting uh, utilities to commit to taking a look at them and and helping out with that process. If there's no process in place, um, Chris, do you have any a key takeaway for us? I think if I were to try to summarize a key takeaway for me, it's uh, better data and more sharing. Like if we can have that path to improving the data set over time of abandoned facilities and improve the way that we share that data uh, with some standards associated with that, it's a good good takeaway for me. Thanks, Chris. How about you, Chris? Well, as I said, you know, if if you start with the installation of when it was new, then you'll have that information until it's dead. Uh, and then uh, 
811 then if they don't want to handle the abandoned line uh, a program like Chris has there in Texas that they sent that information over uh, that'd be perfect uh, and we might be able to correct this in about 50 years Al how about you well, we've uh, discussed a lot of uh, uh, issues with the banded lines. It's certainly a big problem. Uh, we have a lot of sources here where we could uh, collect information and and maybe assemble that into a, uh, a manual or a, a white paper or something like that to distribute. Uh, we have a lot of uh, available information on how to collect and uh, uh, utilize uh the information that we have during the uh, construction process i think we just need to uh, uh, spread the word somehow get everybody involved and then uh, act on it you know it's just a matter of i mean there's we've got what uh, 150 people participating today we all need to spread the word the, the abandoned utilities are an issue and we need to do something about it it's not impossible, right? Right, right. So I think, Whitney, I'm turning it back over to you at this time. All right, thank you, Sandy. So I would like to genuinely thank all of you for joining and a big thank you to our moderator and panelists for sharing their expertise. Please take a moment now to fill out a brief survey that Levi will post in the chat so we can continue to improve these discussions and address topics that are important to you. A town hall blog post will be posted on excavationsafetyalliance.com where you can register for future town halls. Our next town hall will take place February 8th titled, How Can Private Locators Enhance Excavation Safety? As a reminder, the Global Excavation Safety Conference is heading to New Orleans in March. First time attendees can still register for just $811. Again, thank you all for joining and we'll see you next month. Thank you, everybody, and thanks for all your contributions in the chat. Take care.